Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Friday Night Live. I um, hope it's all working. <laughs> I say that every week. Um, I'll get straight on with the questions. There's some good ones today. Um, at the end of May, I'll be five months sober. I haven't really socialised yet sober. I'm starting to get people say we will have you around for a barbecue, etc. Do I say beforehand I'm not drinking or just go with my bottle of alcohol free wine? It's that awkward first announcement. Thanks for everything you do for us, William. <laughs> You're truly amazing. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It is that awkward first announcement. That is the worst bit. Um, but I think the thing to bear in mind is it gets easier after that. The worst part is turning up at a social event, kind of nervous. And what you usually use to allay that feeling of nervousness, and it's a feeling of nervousness that everybody feels when they first arrive at a social event, you usually have a drink to anaesthetize it and you're not going to have that. Um, so it is that first bit that's the worst. And then on top of that, people offer you a drink and you say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not drinking. And then you have some unwanted attention potentially around that moment. Now, the good news is that is the worst part. Um, and as soon as a conversation moves on from that and people relax into their conversation and you yourself relax into talking to people, the nerves disappear. You start to relax and enjoy the event and it gets better from there on. So do bear that in mind. It's that first bit. It's like a, that hump in the road. You get over that and, and you're you know, usually plain sailing after that. Um, I would say it's entirely up to you. I, I personally didn't tell people but then, to be honest, the things I went to, there were there was always soft drinks there. If it was a party, um, there would usually be other people driving. So I was never the only one not drinking. Um, if it was a pub or something living in London, there's generally there, there's not many pubs around that don't have some kind of alcohol free choice. So personally, I didn't bother. Um but you can tell people, I suppose it depends on who you're telling. I mean, if obviously, if you're being invited to a friend of a friend's party, you probably don't want to tell them beforehand. But if it's a close friend or relative, then yeah, absolutely, you can do. Because to a degree, it can take the pressure off having to do it at the actual time. Um, so yeah, I, I would say, really go with your gut instinct on it. Um, but do bear in mind that that first bit is the worst bit. And then after that, it does get easier and easier and I think you'll, you'll be in the same situation as a lot of people because obviously five months sober you've you've stopped during lockdown so it's you know people have stopped doing anything up to a year at the moment even over a year and they've not really done a social event so there's there's going to be lots of people in the same boat as you um so I wouldn't worry too much and actually I'm quite interested to get out myself anyway because I think so many people have been drinking too much during lockdown questioning their drinking and, and trying to stop so it'll be interesting to see I mean it's not unusual to go out and be the only non-drinker there but I'm quite interested to see if actually going forward there might be a few more people jump, jumping on the um, non-drinking bandwagon um, also a question with regards alcohol free beers and wines how many people in the alcohol free community find these drinks triggering I would love to know I know that Many really enjoy them and I would love to be one of them, but I've struggled with substance abuse and for some odd reason find them triggering. So completely avoid much to my frustration. Thanks in advance. So this is an interesting one. I, I, I don't I have a bit of an issue with triggers because I think particularly with alcohol, you can't avoid triggers because you will see people drinking, you know, turn on the TV, there'll be people drinking, you open social media, there's photos of people drinking, but on the radio, then there's songs about drinking and, you know, there's TV shows, it's in books, it's everywhere. So you can't avoid them. Um, what I think is important though, is, is to analyze what these are actually triggering you to do. I mean, I, see lots and lots of alcoholic drinks I'm never triggered to pick them up and drink them I mean I've got a toilet there with a bottle of bleach in it um, I see it every day it doesn't trigger me to tip it down my throat um, in the shed outside I've got a hammer you know when I look at it I don't get triggered to smash my kneecap to smithereens with it um, alcohol is disgusting and you don't want to put it inside yourself it does absolutely nothing and it ruins your sleep and makes you feel anxious and unpleasant um, so I think if you're being triggered by things, really, the, rather than avoiding the triggers, you need to analyse what it's triggering you to do and try to sort of see the falsehood behind it. Um, well, someone put a comment on this um, question, which I thought was quite interesting. And it was, I was drinking an alcohol-free sparkling wine at the start of my sobriety. And I was thinking, come on then, still waiting for the effects to kick in, even though I knew it wouldn't happen. I just stick to soft drinks now 
and tea lifesaver. So I think that's, I think that potentially kind of gets to the nub of the problem with alcohol free drinks. So I drink alcohol free beers. I've got some in the fridge at the moment. For me, they are one of several options for drinking. So I have, I've got tea, I've got water, I've got fruit juices, I've got alcohol free beers, I've got some lemonade, some sparkling water, you know, in the same way I have different foods, I have different drinks. Um, my foods don't contain arsenic or something poisonous for me. And my drinks don't contain alcohol. Um, so for me, it's just one of many soft drink options. So I drink it or don't drink it as I see fit. It doesn't trigger me to tr taste the real thing. I'm absolutely fine with it. But, and I think this is where the problem is, if you're giving up alcohol and really missing it and thinking, well, what I'll do is I'll chug back 16 alcohol-free beers in an evening instead of the alcohol variety and hope that it somehow gives me that nasty dull sensation that alcohol used to give me then of course it's not going to do that and you're going to be you're going to be in difficulties so I think really you really need to be thinking about how you perceive these alcohol free drinks if you're looking at it as I really miss alcohol and I want a substitute then I think you're going to be in trouble but if you're looking at it as you know I like to have a cold drink at the end of the day I don't fancy lemonade today or sparkling water. Well, actually this alcohol free wine's quite nice or this alcohol free beer is quite pleasant. Then I think you should be fine. Um, someone else has then posted another thing here um, about coffee. And I think there, there's a question later on about that. So I'll probably cover off the coffee option um, a bit later on, but I hope that's useful on that point. Um, a question that I would like to know is how other people got over the shame of all the, of all they have done in their drinking past enough, if unable to apologize directly. I tried to make amends by doing volunteer work, but someone said recently, I'm trying to punish myself. I do think that is true as it turns out volunteer. I, I do think that is true as it turns out volunteer work is super rewarding. Just curious on others thoughts and what you recommend. So as I see it, okay, alcohol does a lot of things to us. It, it turns us into some pretty unpleasant people, frankly. It removes all your inhibitions um, and it stops your emotions working properly. So it anesthetizes the inhibitors that um, retard or um, stop your emotions from getting out of hand. So emotions are triggered and then receptors in your brain step in to calm them down and stop them getting out of hand. Now, when you drink alcohol, you anesthetize those receptors that put, a, that put a break on your emotions. So that's why people, when they're drinking, they become very emotionally unstable. So something really minor happens and they just completely lose their temper. That's why there's such a close correlation between alcohol and crime and in particular violent crime, because minor things happen, but people are incapable of regulating their emotions. So it just flies off the handle. And that's why, you know, every year at Christmas, when we were in the office, I'd go home and, you know, seven or eight in the evening, <laughs> the office workers not only throwing up in Liverpool Street Station, but, you know, sat on the floor crying their eyes out because something really minor happens and they just can't. They're, they're like toddlers. Drinkers are like toddlers who can't regulate their emotions. Um, so what alcohol does, it, it makes you really unstable and quite unpleasant. OK, but we're not told this when we, you know, when you're 13, 14, 15 years old, 18, however old you are, when you start drinking, people don't sit you down and say, here's some here's some beer. If you drink it, one, it's addictive um, Two, it's a carcinogen. Three, it's going to ruin your sleep. And four, it's going to make you far more likely to say or do something really unpleasant because it stops your brain working in the way that it ought to. Um, we are sold alcohol on the fact that, yeah, this is fun. It's harmless. Get drunk, have a laugh. It's all, you know, it's all good fun. It's complete and utter nonsense, but that's what we sold it. That's how we sold it. So on the basis that it's fun, it's harmless. We drink it, we get drunk and we do stupid and terrible things. Um, and frankly, bearing in mind, what is there like 80 million people in the UK, 300 million in the US, 80, 90% of them drink it's not surprising that some really dreadful things happen when people are drinking. And I think if you do things when you've been drinking, 
you need to go a bit easy on yourself because did you really think it was going to happen? Most people don't realize what alcohol does. So, you know, if I convince you to have a cup, if I say hey, you have a cup of tea and unbeknownst to you, I've put a drug in it that makes you go completely mad and kill someone. Is that your fault if you go and kill someone? I would say no, because you don't, you didn't understand what you were putting inside yourself. And unfortunately, the truth, the same is true with alcohol. Most people don't appreciate what they're putting inside themselves. They think it's harmless and fun. It isn't. So they do these horrible things. But my point is, don't beat yourself up over it. We as humans love to be able to identify the source of problems and sort of point a finger at them. But unfortunately, sometimes just bad things happen and you, there's no particular blame for it. If you've drunk alcohol, not realizing that it's going to make you do some unpleasant things and you do some unpleasant things, to my mind, you need to go really easy on yourself. Um, so that's what I would say. If you've done terrible things when you are drinking and you have stopped drinking, to me, that's all you need to do to redeem yourself, okay? You have taken the one and only step necessary to make sure it never happens again, okay? You can't change the past. You can only change the future. So in stopping drinking, you have done what you need to do. You have made amends, okay? If you want to do charitable work, then do it. Um, and you've said it's super rewarding. So that's fantastic. Any kind of charitable work is really good. Um, and it's good... I mean, most people benefit from it themselves, as you say there. It's not just, you don't just do these things. It may seem really altruistic to do this stuff because you're helping other people. But actually, most of the time, people do it for the purely selfish reason that it makes them feel good and they like making other people happy. So don't punish yourself. Go easy on yourself, but carry on with your volunteer work if you find it rewarding. I think it's a great thing to do. Um, how long after giving up do you get your energy back? All I want to do is nap. First proper week here. Heard your body can be in shock initially, so wants to sleep. Um, so first week, yeah, absolutely, you're going to be, your body's still, so shock, it's not shock. Um, shock is either an emotional thing where you find something <laughs> literally shocking, or in the medical sense, it's not, it means not enough blood is getting to your brain. Um it's not your body's not in shock but i think it, on the website i've done an article to explain the stages you go through where you quit drinking um so it's probably worth having a look on that but essentially when you drink alcohol it, it is a sedative it's a chemical depressant okay so it, it anesthetizes or inhibits nerve activity so your brain counters it by becoming hypersensitive so when you drink alcohol you go through like an anesthetized stage but then as it wears off there's a corresponding feeling of anxiety so for equal, every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So whatever dull feeling you get from alcohol, you get a corresponding feeling of anxiety when it wears off. Um, so when you're drinking, you never sleep properly because sleep is about going through certain sleep cycles. And one of the main differentiating factors between those sleep cycles is how deeply unconscious you are. So deep sleep is where you're very unconscious, but then there's something called REM sleep where your, your brain lights up almost as if you're fully awake. So when you're sleeping, you go through these different sleep cycles going right up to almost awake and then back down into deep sleep. When you're drinking, because of the sedating effects of the alcohol, the first part of the night, you can't get into those higher consciousness cycles of sleep. And then after about five hours after your last drink, the oversensitization kicks in. So you can't sleep at all. And that's why people, when they drink, wake up at three or four in the morning. It's usually five hours after their last drink and can't get back to sleep. So when you quit drinking, firstly, there's a day or two of being that oversensitization stage where you might find it very hard to sleep. Then after that, what usually happens is it goes back the other way. So if you're a regular drinker, your brain has been in that oversensitization phase for virtually all the time. Because even if you're only drinking, you usually lost about 36 hours. So if you're drinking daily, you're never quite coming out of that phase. You're just completely, you're then drinking more and going back into it. So kind of coming in and out of it, but never quite fully. So when you finally stop, it's the equivalent as if you're drinking, I don't know, seven or eight mugs of really strong black coffee every day and you suddenly cut it out. You're just really drained and tired. Um, and that is so essentially what it is. It's just the chemical in your, your brain works by way of a chemical balance and alcohol interrupts that chemical balance. So when you quit, you go through a period 
because it's alcohol and a, ke a chemical depressant of feeling really tired. Um, so it does take about, a, it can take up to a month or so. Um, most people find a few weeks, but as I say, it's worth going on the website and just having a look at that. Um, hi, William. Thank you as ever for giving your free time to these lives. And of course, yes, to doing a Friday live. As you know, I'm struggling to get back to sobriety, but I always watch your lives and I always get something from them, be it new knowledge, new perspectives, or just a smile at your no nonsense approach. I think my relationship with alcohol is initially a bit more habit than problem, as in work time, no beer, no problem, free time, let's get this party started. And after that habitual one or two, I'm done for, may as well be 10. So my conundrum question is, do I have a problem? I call it habit. Or do I have a problem I call a habit or a habit I call a problem? In your opinion, is there a definable difference? Thank you. I think there is a definable difference. I've talked about this before, but habits are just what a habit is. It's behavior that is repeated um, because it's some way beneficial. Um, and they actually, despite what people think, they're fairly easy to change. So when I was in the office before lockdown, I was in the habit of getting up, having a shower, putting a suit on. Okay, now I'm working from home. I got out of the habit of putting a suit on every day. Um, and it's not a massive problem for me to do it. Um, you know, it's habits are usually easy to change. This, what you're talking about is very different. Now, don't forget with every addiction, there's two sides to it. There's the chemical or physiological side of it, of the withdrawal and the relieving the withdrawal. Okay. But there's also the psychological side of it, a major factor of which is cravings. Now, what a craving is, is when we start to fantasize about our drug of choice. In this case, obviously, we're talking about alcohol um, and we start to fantasize about it. But crucially, we start to um, toy with the idea of actually having it so you may say to yourself right I'm not going to drink but then the evening comes and you just sit there fantasizing about how nice it will be to have a drink and then you start thinking along the lines of well I could just have one or I could just drink tonight and stop tomorrow and etc etc what you're really doing is just torturing yourself it's like a, you know the donkey with the carrot in front of it just constantly reaching forward for this thing so we're kind of like torturing ourselves with it but this is where it gets slightly more complicated and this this is where people struggle to understand how alcohol is addictive because craving does take part in the conscious in the conscious mind um, and to a degree those times that we crave can be controlled by our own like internal barriers okay so let me explain this let's say you've got a smoker okay, who smokes 60 cigarettes a day and has smoked for two decades, okay, so they're clearly very addicted to smoking. If they're sat out in a beer garden or in a pub or in a bar or wherever, they won't be able to go two minutes without lighting up a cigarette. And if for any reason they can't smoke, they will be desperately unhappy and craving that cigarette, okay. These same people will go to bed at night and sleep six, seven, eight hours without having a cigarette and it, they're fine with that. OK, so but as soon as they wake up and the sort of a cigarette enters their mind, they have to have one. So my point here is you can be physically addicted to something. OK, but you can still go for some quite extended periods without it, providing you're not craving it. OK, so let's now move on to the example of a heavy drinker. So let's say we've got someone who's putting away a bottle of spirits or, you know, two, three bottles of wine every evening. Okay. They're taking this sedative and their brain's countering this sedative by becoming hypersensitive. So when the sedative wears off, they're left in that hypersensitization phase, which manifests itself by them feeling really anxious and unpleasant and everything looks a bit too much effort and, you know, that they're a bit emotionally unstable and it's all, you know, life looks all generally quite unpleasant. Okay, so when they wake up in the morning, let's say this person only ever drinks in the evening. Okay, they're fine during the day. As soon as the evening comes, they have to have a drink. When they wake up in the morning, that oversensitization, which is essentially alcohol withdrawal, is with them. Okay, they are getting out of bed. They're exhausted, obviously, because they haven't slept, but they've got that massive kind of unpleasant, anxious, worked up feeling inside them. Okay. If they had an alcoholic drink at that point, they would feel a whole world better. 
because they're anesthetizing that unpleasant feeling. Their brain is on hyperdrive because it's geared up to work under the sedating effects of the alcohol, but the alcohol's not there. So it's racing ahead, going berserk. The quickest way to rectify that chemical imbalance is to have another drink. Okay. So if they woke up in the morning and had an alcoholic drink, they would feel a whole world better. Okay. But unlike the smoker who wakes up and first thing in their mind is right. I want a cigarette. These people don't drink in the morning. It's just not what they do. So instead of waking up thinking about having a drink, they're waking up thinking about got to get in the shower, got to get to work. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. I've got this meeting and all the usual things that fill your mind when you're waking up to work. Okay. Um, so they're not thinking about alcohol. They're not craving it. And they may go through the day, lunchtime, whatever. But as soon as the evening comes, that's the time they can drink. And that's when they think, ooh, a drink would be really nice now. And that's when the craving starts. Okay. So you can have people who are quite heavily physically addicted to alcohol. And by that, I mean, they're going through a full anxiety period during the day, but they're just not taking the drug because they don't do that. They don't even stop to think about having an alcoholic drink in the morning because it's just not what they do. It's these very rigid barriers that they have in place. Um, so when you say here, you know, in work time, no beer, no problem, free time, let's get this party started. That's what most people do. Very, very few people are at the stage of literally drinking the second they wake up. OK, most people, they have these barriers in place, so they're not craving alcohol for most of the time, which means they don't drink most of the time. But as soon as they have the opportunity drink, they, to drink, they can't resist it. So really, they've got both elements there. They've got the physical withdrawal and they've got the psychological craving. But for most of the day, the psychological craving is just not engaged. So I absolutely think it's not habit. It is a problem. Um, and I think you probably need to, to recognize that. Um, the other thing, just there was something else that struck me to say. Yes, yeah, so, so I, I don't think it's habit, okay? Because habits are things that generally we can change fairly easily. Um, I think I gave the, you know, the example before, you know, when I'm on holiday, I'm in the habit of getting up, having some breakfast, and then putting on a pair of swimming trunks and sitting on a sun lounger, okay? I change that fairly easily when I come back. You know, I don't find myself in December getting up in the morning, having breakfast and then sitting out in the freezing cold in swimming trunks in the garden and thinking, oh, I forgot. I, you know, I forgot to change my habit that I was in when I was on holiday. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't work that way. So I think we need to keep very separate habit and addiction. It is a very different thing. Um, so next question, my question is, can you be reset after some time of abstinence so you can moderate again, or is it a case of once you've pushed it too far, pushed it that far, it's to a point of no return and you would always have an uncontrollable issue with alcohol. So, um, no, you can't reset at all because one of the key, um, parts, like the tipping point, if you like, of addiction is when that you start to learn on a con conscious and subconscious level that another dose of the drug will relieve the withdrawal of the previous dose. Okay, so everybody who's ever drunk alcohol has had an unpleasant, anxious feeling when that drink wears off. But most people, you know, people who only have, a, have one or two or one glass of wine, it will wear off. It will leave a very mild, unpleasant feeling. But they probably don't even notice it it's just, you know, you get on with your life and sometimes you feel okay, sometimes you feel less okay and you don't really stop to think about it most of the time. So there is like an unpleasant gnawing feeling there. It's very minor um, and it just doesn't dawn on them to, to do anything. But over years of drinking, what your brain instinctively learns is that when that unpleasant feeling starts to kick in, another alcoholic drink will get rid of it. Okay, that's learned behavior. And what has been learned cannot be unlearned. So you can never you can never reverse that in your brain, if you like. So you could stop for 10 years, 50 years, 100 years if you could manage it. But as soon as you took an alcoholic drink, it would wear off leaving an unpleasant feeling and your brain would think 
I remember this unpleasant feeling, another drink will get rid of it. And so you will want the next drink. And that's why when you, when you hit that point of instinctively knowing that an alcoholic drink will remove the unpleasant feeling caused by the last one, moderation becomes inherently problematic and difficult. Um, why can't I break this habit? It doesn't matter if I'm sad, happy, any mood, and I just drink. What am I missing? Well, I think you need to tell me. This this is too vague to really talk about, but you need to analyze your own drinking. So every time you want a drink, you need to be thinking, what, what is this going to do for me? Why do I want this drink? Is it the taste? Is it the effect? What if the taste, what's so great about this taste? Why can't I have an alcohol-free beer? If it's the effect, what is this effect that is so good? Because I think a lot of us, we just constantly going through the motions with it and not stopping to really analyze it. So we end up building it up to be far more than it is. Whereas if you actually analyze what it does for you and what it doesn't do for you, it, it's a very different thing. So, so that question, I can't really answer. It's just too vague but you need to start analyzing your own drinking and really seeing what it is and crucially what it isn't. Um, when I was drinking, I don't ever remember waking up at 3 a.m. with racing heart, which everyone seems to relate to in terms of symptoms. This can lead me to the maybe I wasn't that bad. I don't believe this will lead me to drink again as my desire for it really has gone. But I wonder your take on this. Thanks. So one thing I would say, and I've come across to quite a lot of people, I don't know if you smoked or smoke or not, because um, nicotine is a very powerful stimulant, okay, like coffee, so it, it wakes you up. So what you usually find with smokers is they smoke during the day, and it sort of keeps them going. And when they stop and go to sleep, because their brain's used to this very powerful stimulant, and it's suddenly not there, they go really deeply asleep, which is interesting, because um, smokers as well get less REM sleep than non-smokers. Now, REM sleep is one of those higher level consciousness areas of sleep. The reason they don't get so much REM sleep is because without the nicotine, their brain is like really desensitized because it's used to this drug that's keeping it awake. So it's almost countering that drug. And so without it, it becomes really overly tired. So it struggles to get you into REM sleep. Now, drinkers and smokers quite often don't wake up at night because of the same mechanism although their brain is still going through that desensitization stage from drinking when you tie it in with nicotine and removing the nicotine again going back to the example imagine if you drank eight cups of really strong coffee every day and suddenly cut it out you'd be like really exhausted that's what smokers do almost every night was when they stop they go really deeply asleep and that can to a degree counter the waking up effect of the um the alcohol not to say that they sleep properly and wake up feeling refreshed they probably feel even worse because of what the cigarettes are doing to them and they're still not going through the sleep cycles they need to go through but what they might find is they're not waking up at night so so that would be the two things it, it may be that um either you're drinking loads of caffeine and or smoking a lot or smoking at the same time can do it but even aside from that everyone is slightly different OK, and, and, and I know people say, well, I don't wake up at night. Well, the fact is you may not wake up at night, but you're still not going through the sleep cycles you need to go through. So that 3 a.m. waking up, you may be someone who just naturally sleeps more deeply. So you were able to sleep through that period. But what you will still find is you're not going through those sleep cycles. So don't think that you were getting away with it because you weren't it is impossible to drink alcohol and go through the natural sleep cycles. It's just not possible for a human being to do it because of its sedating effect. This is now the coffee question. Do you have any thoughts on coffee? I'm alcohol free now for 15 months, but are falling into a cycle of waking up, having three cups of coffee, burning through the morning, then crashing big time in the afternoon. How would you recommend regulating this better? So again, this, this is what I used to do. Um, and it's caffeine. It's a stimulant. So exactly the same principle with alcohol. If you're taking a stimulant, your brain's trying to counter it. And in, usually with stimulants, your brain stops releasing its own naturally occurring stimulants. So this is what I used to do because I didn't drink coffee in the afternoon because I didn't want it to ruin my sleep. So I'd be really hyper all during the day. Um, and then of course, the caffeine would wear off. I wouldn't replace it. So you'd be like really exhausted all afternoon and in the evening. Um, the obvious solution is to cut out caffeine, which 
I haven't managed to do. But what I do drink now is tea. Um, and I find it's less of that, like really anxious -y caffeine hit. It seems to be a bit more gentle. I don't know if it's because there is less caffeine in tea anyway, but I, I have sort of read up on it and there's some other things in there which sort of stimulate you, but a bit more gently. Um, so you could either, if you can manage it, cut the caffeine out entirely. Um, and if you can't, then maybe think about tea instead, because I do find, yeah, you're, you're less manic in the morning, um, but you have a bit more energy throughout the day and into the evening. Um, the other thing with coffee, I'm sure that there might have been another question further down, but I will, will deal with this because I think someone else mentioned about when there was the question about alcohol free drinks and people were talking about what alcohol free drinks they drink. And someone just said they drink loads of coffee. Now, bear in mind with coffee, caffeine is quite a powerful stimulant. And actually being hung over is very much like having too much caffeine. Your brain, it's kind of like being anxious and manic, but not like awake and feeling really buoyant. It's not a pleasant thing. So if you quit alcohol, even without the alcohol withdrawal, if you're guzzling loads of caffeine, you're going to be kind of like anxious and on edge. And they're exactly the kind of times that you want to drink alcohol. So it's almost like taking this thing to make you feel more anxious. And it's exactly the kind of feeling where alcohol does have an apparent good effect because it takes away that feeling of anxiety. So if you are doing that, try desperately do try and avoid the coffee because it, it leaves you feeling quite unpleasant it's probably going to end up making you want to drink alcohol even more to get rid of that unpleasant feeling um i stopped drinking at the end of january after a few years of the stop start stop process i'm at a point now where the message in your books feel more like actual logic rather than theory it's true that you cannot unlearn what you learn and i generally genuinely feel feel that to take alcohol again would be against my new values, knowledge and beliefs. So thank you for these books, etc. The question I have is this, would you please write sugar explained? I'm trying to apply the knowledge from alcohol explained one and two for my sugar issue. And I'm still using willpower. Willpower is just not enough for me. I think the only willpower that will work is the will Porter power based on logical facts rather than all the bleating drama and faff. Well, thank you for that. And gives me an in <laughs> to say, I have written it. I've written a diet and fitness ex explained. So it's not specifically about sugar, although there is a chapter in there about sugar. It's more about sort of diet generally and, and exercise, hence the title. So um, yeah, there's, there's that if you're interested in that. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think there's, you, you can do a similar thing. And if you, if you like the approach of Alcohol Explain 1 or 2, it, it is the same approach just with sort of diet and what we eat and hunger and feeling full and all that kind of stuff. So it kind of does a bit of a deep dive on, on diet and fitness. Uh, my question is about moving on. I'm eight months sober and alcohol is a small and irrelevant thing in my life. So this is about moving on, moving forward. I want new sober friends. There are a lot of private membership groups that you pay for. I watch lots of lives on Instagram. How do you know what to join? I know you will probably say go for what aligns with your interests, but that means joining and shelling out cash. Any advice, thoughts? So there are specific groups and um, someone put in, for example, in the comments, um, Fish Followers Society. So, I mean, when you talk about shelling out cash, I, I, Dawn will put in, oh, if she's watching, she'll put in the comments how much it is, but it's nothing. Bearing in mind, like a bottle of wine's like, what, 10, 15 quid, and how much were you spending on those every day? Um, I can't remember what it is, but it isn't, it's nothing compared to what you were spending on alcohol. But the other thing is generally, when we because we drink a lot and we like to be around people that are drinking over the decades that you're drinking you tend to end up being with people who drink a lot that's just how things go if you stop drinking and start just getting interested in other things you don't necessarily have to go to social things that are specifically only for non-drinkers so like years ago i joined a walking club um, and people there drank, but that wasn't the whole point of the thing that, you know, because the point of it was to go walking. So yeah, people may drink or may not drink, but the point is they didn't, you didn't go out all evening and sit in a pub for six hours getting hammered. 
Um, and it's the same for other things like a tennis club or a cycling club or a running club or a book club. It's not about the alcohol. So generally, even if there are drinkers there, that's not what the event's about. Um, so that might be worth looking into. But I would say exactly what you've said, align with your interests, just just find something you enjoy um, and start getting more involved in it. Um, I frequently see questions from family members asking what they can do about their drinking loved one. Some folks say, let them hit rock bottom. I know you touched on that last week. Others say you can't help them unless they ask for it. What are your thoughts? And if you have things to suggest, I've written you about them or considered writing content directed at loved ones. I'll have you written about them or considered writing content directed at loved ones. So not specifically, but what I would say is this whole thing about having to hit rock bottom or whatever, I, I wouldn't go too much in for. But the fact of the matter is most, most people are interested in improving their lives if they can do. OK, they may feel it's very difficult to do it and, and more difficult to make it impossible. Um, but the fact of the matter is, um, I think if you can try and say to people that, you know what, there is another way, life is better not drinking and it's not about just giving up alcohol and feeling miserable about it. Um, and I know it's probably um, too obvious to even say, but try and get them to read the book. When, when I recommend, when, when people say, you know, I've got the book and I, you know, my partner or whatever won't read it. What I usually say to them is don't give it to them as in this is to make you stop drinking. Just give it to them. You, you don't have to stop drinking. Just read this and get some information. Um, and that's how I would give it to people not to stop drinking, but just this is about alcohol. You should, you know, if you're drinking, you anyone who's drinking should read it and understand it and then be able to make a you know proper decision on, on whether they drink or not. Um, day 39 here. Thank you. Your book, the Zoom meetings, Jamie and all involved have been a rock for me. So overall, I feel much better. I had thought that magically all my problems would just up and disappear once I stopped drinking. Quite the opposite. They were waiting for me. I just never noticed when I was drinking. So I'm dealing with them with a clear head and thought process. I'm not missing alcohol. However, just lately, I've been struggling with insane cravings to eat junk at night. I don't want to replace one addiction for another. I've been reading posts about people suffering from pause. I'm not anticipating going through this as I don't think it's a given. I'd appreciate your opinion on this. I've also heard that pause is something alcohol industry has made up in order to frighten people not to quit. Also, my sleep score is great. Thank you, Fitbit. Resting heart rate, good, but I'm sleeping about one and a half hours less per night now, but actually having better quality sleep. Is this also normal? Sorry for all the questions. Once again, I reiterate that no other book program has worked for me. I'm delving into your workbook now, so thank you. So, quite a few questions there. Um, da, 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 da. So, so the first one is cravings to eat junk food at night. I don't want to replace one addiction with another. So, firstly, eating junk food at night is not ideal. Um, it's probably, in fact, it's certainly better than drinking. But what we're looking at, I suppose, is not just getting better, but trying to live the best life we can. Now, the problems with eating rubbish at night when you digest food, it has to go through something like 20 foot of digestive tract and your, your body kind of squeezes it through all of it. And as you digest it, a lot of heat, it creates a lot of heat and internal movement. So eating loads of food, particularly junk food, which is, you know, quite heavy and quite difficult to digest will impact your sleep. Um, not quite as extreme as alcohol will impact it, but it will impact your sleep. If you have a massive meal late at night, you will wake up usually feeling a bit drained and tired the next day because you won't have slept properly, even if you haven't woken up. Um, so absolutely try and avoid doing that. Um, try and eat, you know, tr try not to eat for like five or six hours if you can manage it before bedtime, because that's how you will get the best sleep and actually then wake up feeling a lot more refreshed. Um, the other thing, poor, so post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Um, I, I, I didn't suffer from it. I know many, many people who didn't, it's incredibly vague. Um, it's not something that you, know, you can do a test on and say, yes, you have got post-acute withdrawal syndrome. It, it's a collection of very vague, mainly psychological issues like, you know, depression and insomnia and anxiety and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I haven't had it and lots and lots of other people haven't had it. Um, 
it may well tie in with just that whole thing. And there, there is quite a specific um, situation where you know people give up, they feel a lot better, but then that feeling a lot better becomes the norm. We start to take it for granted. And then we start to fantasize about how good our drinking was and fading effect bias starts to kick in. So it may as well, it may well just be as simple as that, starting to take your sober life for granted and start to think you, that you miss alcohol. Um, what you say about sleep is absolutely the case. I'm sleeping one and a half hours less per night, but actually having better quality sleep, this is absolutely normal. When you're drinking, you're not getting the sleep, so going through the sleep cycles you need. So you can lie in bed for 12 hours um, and still get up feeling really tired. When you cut out the alcohol and providing everything else falls into place, all right, for example, the food and the caffeine, and all the rest of it, you won't need as much sleep because you will go to bed, you'll go through the sleep cycles you need, and you will wake up feeling refreshed. What I say is the measure of sleep is not how many hours you're unconscious for. It's whether you're waking up feeling fresh and ready to go during the day um, and not feeling like really exhausted and wanting to sleep all day long. Um, if, if you're okay on those two points, then your sleep's fine and you will find you're sleeping a lot less than when you were drinking because you're getting the sleep you need and then you're up and ready to go. Um, tricky dilemma. I would like to teach my son what alcohol really is as he starts to get older. He's currently 10 and what it does, etc. how bad it is. However, my husband, his dad still drinks. And my worry is that the truth will freak him out, which then puts pressure on my husband to stop, which isn't fair in my opinion, as he's never had a problem with alcohol. Um, and it isn't, and isn't in a place where he needs or wants to stop much as it would obviously be better for him. Any advice on how to teach children that it is bag and a drug, but not frightening them about people they love who still drink? Thanks. Love the Friday talks. So you can't do both. I mean, my son's 10 as well. I've got a 10 and an eight year old. If you're saying to a child that it's bad and a drug, then they're going to look at people who do it and sort of question them. Um, so two things I would say. Firstly, um, tell him the truth, which is that it's bad and it's a drug. <laughs> you can't go far wrong with that. Um, and the knock on effect of it is, yeah, he may look at your husband and question him. I have a similar thing in that. Uh, that's what I've said to my kids. Um, and then they look at other people. And it's like, oh, so and so dad drinks and this, that and the other. And it's like, well, fine. I'm not going to lie to them about it. Um, look at it this way. What if, what if it was a cigarette? What if your husband was smoking a couple of cigarettes a week? Would you be saying to your son, oh it's okay as long as you don't smoke too you know you wouldn't do that would you and and this is kind of my issue with alcohol is we, we still don't see it for what it is we still have this idea that you know in, in small amounts or whatever it's okay it isn't it's a carcinogen with absolutely no benefits um so tell them the truth it is I mean, what terrible things will happen to your son if he goes through his entire life and never touches a drop of alcohol for me, it's a no brainer. Um, and yeah, there, there are knock on consequences. There always are with children because you say something to some to them and then they go off and tell the wrong person what you've said. And it's, you know, it can be quite embarrassing, but I, I will not be lying to them. I won't, I won't be telling them it's okay to drink in moderation because it isn't. There's no reason to drink in moderation, no reason to drink at all. Um, what are your thoughts on supplements, vitamins, and helping healing the mind and body and recovery? I don't really go much in for it, to be quite honest. Um, I think if you're eating a healthy, decent diet, all the vitamins and minerals you need are in there and your body will be absorbing them. Um, but some people swear by them. So that, that is just my personal view. I personally don't take any, I just sort of have a fairly healthy diet. Um, and yeah, but I'm, I, I see quite often posts in the group about what should I take? And there's always lots of people ready to give, you know, advice on what they've personally found useful. So I can't really, probably not really my thing, to be honest. But if you are interested, put a post in the group. Because as I say, there, there'll, there'll always be people there to give some advice. Um, I'm seven month alcohol free and I don't miss alcohol and really get cravings. However, my question is this. I set myself a year off the booze. And as I tip over the halfway point, I notice I've had thoughts about will I drink again after the year is up? I'm struggling to make the firm commitment with myself that I will never drink again and wonder if this is normal, even though I'm enjoying the freedom from alcohol and don't miss it. Any suggestions on how to shift my mindset once and for all? Um, just be realistic about what you're going back to. Um, you 
won't have drunk for a year. So you'll pr- presumably be sleeping well. You'll be fairly energetic. You'll be feeling fairly positive. You will be going back to drinking something that tastes foul with loads and loads of refined sugar in it. So massive amounts of empty calories you don't need. Um, it will increase your heart rate, which will interfere with your ability to exercise and also interfere with your energy levels. So you have a lot less energy. Um, but at the same time, it will ruin your sleep. So you'll be waking up tired and exhausted the next day. Um, it's extremely expensive. I mean, even, you know, what is a pint in a pub now? I dread to think um, five, six pounds or something. Um, so massively expensive. It tastes disgusting. It's carcinogenic as well. Um, so, you know, you might as well be thinking about whether to start, you know, smoking more Marlboro, morning Marlboros or something. Um, it will make you, because you haven't been drinking regularly, you haven't got any withdrawal to relieve. So it will just make, make you feel slightly dulled and tunnel visioned. Um, and as I say, it will then wear, it will make you feel tired and heavy and lethargic um, and wear off then leaving a corresponding feeling of anxiety and will ruin your sleep leaving you bad tempered <laughs> and out of thoughts the entire rest of the day. So <laughs> your decision, choose which life you want, really. Um, I'm just shy of 15 months alcohol free. My question is around sleep. I get around 30 minutes to wind down prior to bedtime during the week. Due to work, household chores, teenage girls, 13 year old twins, pray for me. Good Lord, you get the picture. After giving up the wine, I started drinking herbal teas, but were disturbed in the night visiting the loo. Lately, as I fall to sleep, I am noticing some really minor anxiety, my heart racing a bit as my mind closes down. This has just started and would have been the next morning in the past. Just wondered if this was something you've come across before um, this far into sobriety. And if so, do you have any suggestions? I should mention that my job is only part-time, but stressful. I love it, but lots of difficult conversations in a day. As soon as that finishes, my girls get home from school. Um, Thank you for all you do. Your live and books are brilliant. Um, So uh, it sounds like you've got an extremely stressful life, part-time job, but a stressful one, and and 13-year-old twins. Good Lord. I mean, that must be phenomenally um, difficult. What I would say is, yeah don't don't start drinking loads of tea at night time because as you say you'll just be getting up in the night going to the toilet which is the last thing you need um i'm not surprised you have anxiety at night time what is usually good rather than (laughs) trying to consume something to relax you which is a habit we need to get out of try and do something else so i usually go to bed and read a book um and if it's something good and something you're engaged in it just it's got everything because it takes your mind off whatever stuff was going on during the day and just transports you into just something different, just takes your mind off your problems um, and then wind down and fall asleep. Um, So that's what I do. So yeah, you could try that um, or anything you like doing really. Um, Anything, you know, people do meditation, but I really think reading is almost a form of meditation anyway. Meditation is about taking your mind out of all your stresses and strains and sort of concentrating on something else. And and really, for me, reading is kind of a part of that. Um, I hope that was useful, everyone. That's all the questions. Um, Have a good weekend and I shall see you next week.